about one and a half year ago. Um, we none of us had met each other before, and uh, we'd, we'd met individually uh, through various connections, um, but we'd never met each other, all of us together at the same time. And we all decided, let's meet here in Shenzhen, uh, just north of Hong Kong, uh, in China, which has become the sort of capital of hardware development uh, in the world. It's, think of it as the equivalent of Silicon Valley. Uh, what Silicon Valley is for software, Shenzhen is for hardware. And so we went there and we partic uh, participated in an accelerator called Hacks uh, to bring sort of our first idea, uh, which was a, a connected um, fire alarm uh, to market. Uh, that connected fire alarm has changed uh, quite a lot along the way, at least in terms of functions and features, but not maybe so much in visual uh, aesthetics. Uh, we're fortunate to have some investors from uh, around the world, and uh, I'm not going to talk much about them. So our first product is called Point. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, this is the this unit comes from the pre-production batch that we did a few weeks ago. Uh, this is the first thing that we're now bringing to market. Um, it, imagine you're sitting in your sofa at home, um, and you, uh, it's, sort of, it, it's entirely quiet, and you can sen kind of sense and hear what's happening in your home. Your home, like your freezer makes a bit of uh, noise once in a while, um, and there's like, y you notice if your window is left open because you hear the, you recognize the noise from the street, uh, you hear when people are coming and so on. We wanted to kind of provide the same awareness when you're not there. And we wanted to do that without compromising that feeling of being home or that feeling of like being in your space. So we do, we, we really try to do this camera free. We don't use any cameras to, to look at what's happening. Uh, and instead we use a range of sensors uh, to to figure out what happens, and we pull all that data, and very crucially, try to convert that into uh, information that you would care about. Uh, so if your fire alarm goes off, uh, Point will notify you uh, in an app, and you'll know that something happened. Um, I'm going to play a short introduction video, just so you have an idea of what it is we're trying to build. Point is a smart house oh. It lets you know if anything is wrong at home. Point can identify sounds like alarms or windows breaking. It can sense smoke and other airborne hazards. You set your own rules for how you want Point to respond to events. For example, it can light up if there is a loud noise late at night. Point is simple and unbranded, allowing it to blend into any home, anywhere. It's a softer approach to home security. So. Um, I'm very briefly, uh, the events that it detects, uh, someone comes home, uh, it shows up in a timeline, and we center kind of a lot of our uh, communication around this timeline, and you set the specific settings for like what is applicable to you and trying to guide the user to uh, wh where is this uh, in your home and so on. Um, we have a lot of ideas for where this can go. Uh, this is sort of an early uh, start still. Um, and as you'll notice, these screens are slightly different than what was in the video already. Um, in November last year, we launched on Kickstarter and uh, we sold about 3,000 units, so it's slightly more than 3,000 units, and raised around 240,000 US dollars. That was four or five times our goal. Uh, and it took us to, uh, it, it, it sort of got us to some parts of where we are today, but it's definitely not the entire story. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about like what crowdfunding is and isn't, uh, although we can probably spend a whole session also talking about crowdfunding, which is very interesting in itself. But I wanted to take a step back and sort of what, what was it that sort of where we are and what like maybe like why we are here today and like what where like what is this opportunity? Uh, what did we see changing in IoT and uh, things being connected and so on? Um, we we were joking like we maybe we don't all like Edison, but he he was talking about uh, opportunity and uh, and. A, 
it may be really hard to see, uh, but I think we're starting to see a lot of things that are changing and that, that, are, that have changed in the past few years. Um, and some of the things that are different today is that we have these smartphones and we, we all learn, learn, like here we already know about that, like we have smartphones everywhere, they enable us to interact differently with devices and with our surroundings. Prototyping has become very cheap. Uh, the first, uh, like 3D printing is sort of obvious, it came, comes to a, a lot of people's mind, but it's also in terms of the electronics. We have more available platforms like Arduino. Uh, there's an initiative at Mobile Heights, uh, which has, which I forget the name of. Uh, there's at least one company here in, in Malmö using it, ModCam. Um, so we can do both electronics prototyping and also like physical prototyping much more easier than we could before. Uh, crowdfunding has become a huge success. We all see the Kickstarters. We see failing Kickstarters and we see exploding Kickstarters. Uh, uh, there are other platforms. Uh, we're very, we're sort of leaning very heavily against the Kickstarter one um, for some reasons, but there are definitely more of them. Um, Internet of Things, in terms of connecting, it's also become a lot more easier and accessible to connect things. The price of Wi-Fi chipsets has gone down dramatically. Uh, so, like, what putting that, that that type of technology in products today has become a lot more cheap. Uh, so it's much more cheaper to connect the stuff. Um, we also look at uh, logistics. There have sprung up companies, uh, Chipwire and Flexport, which take like for a small company like us, we're seven people today, uh, seven and a half. We have a part time as well. Um, logistics is not something we can do ourselves, but there has been companies, partly because of the sort of Kickstarter growth, to just facilitate shipping products to customers all over the world. Uh, and you don't have to worry about warehouses or uh, like figuring out how you should distribute your stock to reach the the people, and like, all of this is done sort of for you in in a sense. Like, uh, of course you pay for it, but it's become much more accessible. And then, sort of the big thing, and the big thing for us has been, uh, and I think for a lot of people, uh, is China, and we've seen a dramatic change over the last few years, where. Uh, the manufacturers in China are much more willing to talk to small companies. Uh, previously, uh, they might not even have spoken English, but they're already also employing people who speak much better English. And so you can start to interact with them. And they are welcoming uh, foreign companies to, to go there and to like talk directly with them. Uh, whereas maybe a few years ago, either you had to be very big uh, or you'd give it to... Uh, um, I, I forget the term, but like a, an agency kind of, or an, a, like a complete manufacturer is like, hey, I want this produced, and they would tell you the price this is going to be. But you had no idea of what actually the cost of the production for that unit would be. And so all of these things have also changed like in the terms of they being much more welcoming. Uh, part of that ha may have to do with uh, sort of pir the piracy hardware that we've seen in China, that they've kind of, kind of built this ecosystem of doing things a lot more easily, and it's becoming much more available uh, to everyone. Not everything has changed. There's a lot of things which are still the same. Uh, we still need people. You still need people to build things and to do stuff and to, uh, to talk to the manufacturers, and you need to understand all of these things, and you need to have people who understand it. Um, I come from a software background, so for me, hardware was like very hard, and it seemed very foreign. Uh, it's definitely not the equivalent of software bits. Uh, when I sit at my screen and Frederick is running tests to see if our uh, point is protected against, uh, like search protected from ESD or electrostatic discharges, uh, when my screen flickers, that's a very different experience from what I've had before. Uh, where mostly it's test cases failing. And, and so here, th this is not going to go away. Uh, distribution is also hard, so later in the process, and I think Carl has very like, interesting experiences to share maybe on this part, but you still have to get your product out there, and you have to m get people to see it, uh, and that may 
be like selling through uh, various channels or like hooking up with a big uh, company that can put it in stores. Uh, but retail has its own capital requirements, which is very interesting and challenging. So, so this is still uh, sort of hard, and it's still a lot of like footwork. Um, supply chain, you need to get your components. This has been sort of one of our, and it's one of our current uh, sort of biggest uh, hassles, uh, getting all the components delivered to your factory on time. Uh, turns out to still be very hard. Uh, and this has partly to do with your size. So as a very small company, it can be hard to get everything. You don't have a much of leverage, uh, whereas if you're um, Ericsson or Apple or someone else, they have a much more punch. Uh, so when you come and you say you want your products, they're actually going to be there. Uh, for us, it's not necessarily the same. Um, and this then ties into manufacturing, where you still have to work uh, a lot with the developers. It's a very manual process, despite all our advances in robotics and whatever. A lot of it is people still putting stuff on the uh, circuit boards and, and making sure things fit together. They're put in boxes. Uh, you have to teach them how to do, how to assemble your product, and you have to be there. So we spend a lot of time there. Uh, that's why we've been there since. We, we actually never really left since we went to China last year, but we've been changing who's there, so we go back and forth quite a lot. So Edison had this quote, uh, which is why he still gets to be in the presentation, that opportunity is missed by most people because it's stressed in overalls and looks like work. And it is a lot of work. So even though it's become a lot easier, uh, it, still, uh, takes some, it still takes some work to get from a prototype to a product. I'm going to go briefly into like I'm going to go into sort of our journey and we'll see how far we get. Uh if something feels boring, like please tell me or if I should speed up on some things. Uh or if you want to know more like stop like how, how does this work? Um but there are essentially three phases. You explore uh figuring out what is the problem, what are you trying to solve? And this is very similar like whether you do hardware or not or whether hardware is involved in the process or not. Uh then you prototype this is also very similar, but we use different tools. We 3D print, we, we build stuff, and we, we, test, uh, we test different platforms to see what works. Uh, and then sort of the complicated, uh, like at least one complicated part is then like actually building the product and taking it from a prototype to the, to the final thing. Um, a friend of ours and a mentor at the Accelerator, uh, he translates this to building the right thing, uh, building the thing right, and then shipping the thing. Uh, so really like this exploring, prototyping, and product, like making it the product. Um, I mentioned that our, prob our, our product started as a connected fire alarm. Uh, it, we started talking a lot to people, uh, it's like phoning up, like where is our market? Like why, why wh should we do a connected fire alarm? And once we started talking, uh, we also started realizing that the connected fire alarm was only like part of the, like kind of a problem. But most people had fire alarms and they were not really willing to pay <laughs> for a connected fire alarm in, it, in like only that. Um, we eventually ended up talking to a lot of Airbnb hosts. Uh, and that was part of sort of um, like from what we learned when talking to previous people. And we figured out, so what we, we started learning that the Airbnb house had some worries that like when they rent out their space, uh, they want to know that the guests are sort of, they stay within the sound limits so they don't have a huge party at three o'clock in the night. Uh, but also that the home is sort of generally uh, like okay. So that they know everything is fine. Uh, when they when they are not there or when when their guests are there, and that is how we started narrowing down and like taking that feedback in and sort of building out the microphone. Like th we threw out the, the the fire alarm, and that was partly a um, uh, a certification process because that turns out building fire alarms is very expensive, and you have to certify, and it's like two hundred thousand dollars or something just in certification, um, and we added the microphone to, to sort of listen to 
uh, to the existing fire alarms instead. And then we found out that, oh, hey, we can use that for so many other, th other things. So we could also re detect other types of events using this and also by like sampling and like sort of putting that together with other types of sensor data. Um, and you iterate and you iterate and it kind of looks like this and you go off on tangents and you, and I think we all felt like this a bit like when we're, when we're starting out, we don't really know where we're going and then we, we hear something, we come back to it. Uh, for me, the hard part I think is letting go of things that you should not do. Uh, and the things that you've you started doing and you feel like this is nice, but there's no one willing to pay for it or uh, or it's just not worth your time at the moment or something like that to me is very hard. And I think in, in our team, I'm still sort of the no sayer and I'm very conservative in terms of like, no, no, we should stick to this and then we can fight it out uh, and we discuss. And that part of is also part of, sort of the iteration process. Um, so you have this idea and you have the prototype. I, th this is sort of a waterfall thing. I'm not entirely sure. We, I think this is sort of also a bit more like the previous slide where you iterate kind of back and forth a lot. And you, the idea and the prototyping goes together. You like start building something and you come back to it. Um, so this is the very first uh, prototype that worked right-ish. Uh, and it you would see that there is some similarities in, in how it looks still. It's still round and it's, it was about this slightly larger than this. Uh, and this had a, 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 another platform called Spark, uh, which is Wi-Fi connected and you can also program fairly easily. Um, and, and it looks hairy. Uh, uh, and then you build something at the same time. So we had two product prototypes at the same time, and this one looked right. Or we, we started iterating like what we wanted it to look like. Uh, Nils spent an enormous amount of time of getting the patterns of uh, these dots right. Uh, and, and I think actually they look great. Uh, but it's impressive how much time you can spend on this. Um, and then you also start doing something that feels right. Like you have to still interact with the user and you have to start seeing the experiences together. Like you put the app together and, and the app you saw in the video uh, was actually a HTML mock-up. It didn't do anything, it wasn't connected to the back end. Uh, it was mostly like you press button and something appeared and, and you got the feeling of like, yeah, okay, maybe like I get this idea. And it started to feel right, but you'd still iterate on it. Um, we dropped uh, the HTML part and we do native uh, now uh, instead because of many reasons. Um, once you have your prototype and at some point you have to kind of decide, okay, this now I should not change anymore. Like now this is like this is where I should stay here and this is like what it's going to look like. Because at some point you need to start talking uh, and also figuring out the cost of what it what it what it means to like build the thing. Uh, and that's where the point, uh, and, and okay, so there, there's a lot of things here, but th like this is probably the point where you, where you should go to China uh, if you haven't been there before. Uh, because here is where it's really useful to talk to all the people who are in Zhenzhen, who have all the experience of bringing so many different products and prototypes to market and building them. So they, they have a, 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 like huge amounts of experience in terms of putting things together. How do you make stuff buildable? Like your prototype might work for one or two prototypes, but how do you scale that into making thousands of units? And how do you make thousands of units per week, uh, et cetera? So like putting that like putting all of their knowledge into building something is very different. So for a long time, I was very confused here because it, it felt like we were just, it was all the same. And I was like, I couldn't figure out like why were we a 1.2 degree angle like moved because it had to release from a, um, like uh, wh what's it called again? Yeah. Plastic mold, yeah, exactly. So when you make plastic, you, you have these huge molds uh, and it, it has to come out of the mold. And this ang these angles play a huge importance in that. I had no idea. Uh, but it's still, so And if you look at this one very closely, you'll also see these angles. And there are a lot of them also inside. Uh, so these are the things that your, uh, the people you start to talk to here can help you with. 
The second reason why you want to go to uh, Shenzhen or which, where, which w w at least why we think you should go to Shenzhen is that you, you need to figure out all the costs. And there are, uh, this is a picture of Shenzhen by the way, our office in China is uh, somewhere here in this building. Uh, this used to be the 14th highest, tallest building in, in the world at some point. Uh, this city didn't exist 30 years ago. It was a village of around 300,000 people. Today, I think there are 15 million people living in Shenzhen. Uh, it's an incredible city. It's super intense, uh, but it's, uh, and, and it has everything. The things you need to figure out in terms of cost, um, to check how I am on time, um, is something called bill of materials. Uh, bill of materials is like all the stuff that you need, like all the components that go on your circuit board, your circuit board, uh, anything like that goes together with that. So if you need, uh, we have um, we have magnets. Uh, uh, in here that like so you you, uh, you like screw this one uh, in your ceiling and then this one attaches to here so then you uh, attach it to the ceiling like these magnets you need to figure out the price of these things uh, the plastic uh, mold itself uh, what does it cost uh, and you need this like the, the actual price here will be something per unit like x dollar per unit you produce um, that is probably, that's gonna change whether you make 100, uh, 10,000 or like 100,000. And of course, hopefully that lowers. Um, then there are some other, like th there's another, the next level from here. W was this understandable by the way? Like, yeah. yeah. Um, the next level of sort of the other costs that you have is included in terms of like, how do I get the product to the customer? Uh, how much should I, like how much do I spend on shipping? the product worldwide. Uh, we have customers in 60 countries, I think. And luckily, we, we, luckily there are these other companies that I talked about that figure out how to get it there uh, and so on. But you still need to like, take account for these costs. Uh, packaging, like how do, you pack, how do you put the box together? Uh, and there's, like, there's some other costs involved that you also need to, uh, to, to be aware of. Um, and you do this for kind of two reasons, like or multiple reasons, I guess. I mean, one, you want to know how much it costs, but you also need to put the price eventually on your product. And that is going to be very much decided based on these factors. Um, while you're in Shenzhen, you also have the opportunity then to talk to all these manufacturers. And they're called CMs or contract manufacturers. Uh, and an interesting part here is that it's sort of when you're, even though they're very happy to have you there and they're much more welcoming now, you still have to kind of sell your product or sell your vision of why should they like take on you as a customer. Because if you're very small, like we are still, uh, for them, it might not be worth their time uh, because you're such small numbers and they want to know that you can like, this is something that they can grow with and that can, they can also make money on sort of in a longer term. It's not just a one-off thing. Uh, and that's going to kind of affect your price as well. There are very different sizes of contract manufacturers. Uh, some are um, smaller and some are like much bigger, uh, like much, much bigger. They make stuff for Apple and they like in millions or millions and millions. Uh, so you need to find someone who's able to produce at the numbers you want. Uh, typically, this happens, like typically you have a dialogue. So you, actually, you go and meet a lot of them and you pitch your product uh, and you explain like what it's doing and so on. And then you also try to match what, with what they have built before. Are the, is the contract manufacturer able to produce your type of product? Have they done similar or at least not maybe in the same field, but like electronically similar or physically like hardware similar? Uh, before and there was there's an interesting so some friends of ours they're making a they're making an uh, how do you say insole uh, for your shoe uh, which measures um, 
uh, for people who have like problem with their feeling, I, I, I don't think they said like a medical condition somehow. They, you can't really feel uh, pressure or something. Um, so they make this connected insole that will tell them like you're walking incorrectly or there's like some problem. I'm unsure about the details. The interesting part is, well, um, one of the interesting parts is that it's hard to find, like if you want to make insoles, they, there are some manufacturers who are really good at making insoles. There are some, there are some manufacturers who are really good at making electronics. There are not that many who are good at doing the both. So you need to find someone who's comfortable in doing both the electronics and an insole and like putting these two together. Uh, so you also need to find the right, it's very important, I would say, to find the right manufacturer for like your type of product. Uh, we work with the uh, factory now and they've done similar things before. They are able to scale up uh, uh, to like, I don't know, I think for some other customers they do maybe 10,000 10, units a month uh, or something like this, which is room for us to grow. Uh, it's not like an incredible amount. Uh, so if you grow more than that, it's probably going to be challenging. Uh, but then at that point, you can definitely afford to move to another one as well. So. Um, a little bit of both, I guess. Uh, so so um, through the accelerator uh, that we went through, that opened a lot of doors. Um, we met companies who have not been through. The, uh, the accelerator is well known in the area now, so they have a lot of connections. Uh, but there, we have met several companies who have also like just lined them up beforehand and said, like, okay, uh, we, we have one month. We're going to visit 20 different manufacturers. Uh, you should probably not buy the return ticket uh, because lining up the meetings might not be so easy and so on. So like, ex like going there, expecting to spend some time there, and living there is like super cheap still. Uh, hotels and, and and food is you get lunch for I think seven kroner or something. Uh, so. Noodles. <laughs> so, and you, of course, there's the other end of the spectrum as well. But, um, um, but yeah, they, they, I'm. I don't know. They're they're definitely like other agents, I guess, there as well. Uh, but once again, you ended up. You kind of end up in this like middleman position, and you're not really sure who's introducing who. Uh, so it's definitely worthwhile also visiting different ones, even if you don't end up going with them. Uh, and then we talked about uh, third party logistics, um, like it's become uh, for, for shipping, etc. cetera. Um, crowdfunding was the, yeah. Good question. Design for manufacture. Um, there are a lot of terms. Uh, uh, crowdfunding was right for us, must not it is not necessarily right for everyone. Um, it's, I think, a lot of people confuse it with validating your product and validating your market. Crowdfunding is really about validating if a lot of people experience a, s a problem you're describing. It's not so much about validating whether you are building the right product still. Uh, it's also important to take into account and why, why, uh, why it might not be so much about the funding or so much about the crowd is that the, cr the crowds on crowdfunding sites are very, uh, um, how do you say, they're very s ho homogenic or like, like very similar. Uh, the, and it, if you look at Kickstarter, like it's mostly men between 25 and 35 who have way too much money. Uh, uh, to spend on things. So you have to be very careful about like if, if this is something that maps and like, uh, like uh, you have to be careful about applying uh, what you learn from that um, and translating that into a, a, like a product success. Uh, but it's definitely much more so a way of validating there's, a, there's people thinking about the same problem and they're interested in, in the solution. Um, so, and there are some other like hidden 
thought things about crowdfunding. And if you look at the campaign, and so let's say you raise approximately hundred thousand um, dollars, and and out of those, at least ten k is gonna go into bounced uh, as a credit cards not being uh, having sufficient funds, fees for the crowdfunding site, uh, or also people complaining, hey, I want my money back. And we've been, like, if someone comes and say, hey, I want my money back, we give them their money back because they're probably, it saves us more time not to fight them uh, and you give them their money back. Um, Um, so N Nils put this number together, and I'm uh, uh, unsure why, why you're, where he got this like 30k in components uh, from. But the fact is, like your tooling and your components is gonna account for a vast amount of what you need, like the funds you erase. Um, at the end of the day, uh, what you have left of crowdfunding or like uh, of a hundred thousand k uh, is more something like 40 and that i think this is a i think this is a very con like optimistic uh, estimate or like these are very conservative because in your early stages and we notice this now is that you're going to have so many unforeseen things that it's going to cost you money it, like in the end it translates into money or time um and one sometimes you can solve it by spending more money because you reduce time um and like I can give a concrete example uh, now. So we we use in in point we use uh, an an LED in here to uh, measure particles, and we look at what's in the air. Uh, it turns out to be kind of hard uh, to get hold of, uh, and th th it's available uh, if you buy it off uh, stores like. DigiKey, who are, I guess, more like available. For, you can buy small quantities, like 25 of them. Uh, but we needed something like 8,000 uh, of them. And like we emptied their stock and a lot of other people's stock. And we spent more money on getting these fast rather than having to wait for a, dis like a supplier to produce them. And your lead times on some components is going to be like three months or two months. Uh, and that's also depending on like how much you want to pay for stuff. So the more you pay, of course, you, you might be able to get it faster. But some things are not going to happen faster. Uh, sometimes you can spend more money to make it go faster. Uh, sometimes not. There's also sort of a lot of hidden and interesting uh, trade-offs.